All right. Well, it is 1500 hours here in Pacific time. Um, very pleasant good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where in the world uh, you might be joining us from. But wherever you're coming from today, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate you coming uh, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Milburn. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my background, uh, I'm a retired police officer out of Colorado and Wyoming, spent a few years in Iraq as a bomb dog handler and trainer, but I'm also uh, the president of the International Casino and Resort Working Dog Association, and we are greatly honored to be joined today by uh, Bob Eden. Um, Bob Eden is a legend, obviously, in our <laughs> in our uh, world. Um, he is the author of the Canine Supervisor's Manual. I know you're shaking your head. You're very humble, Bob. <laughs> but we very much appreciate you coming today. Uh, Bob also is the purveyor and kind of the man behind the curtain at CAT's uh, Canine Record Keeping System. Uh, big fan of that as well. Uh, but today we're mostly going to be talking about uh, canine handler selection. So if you have Bob's book, um, it is chapter seven in the book. Uh, if you don't have Bob's book, I highly suggest you get it. Uh, but more or less, that's what we're talking today. Uh, and today's going to be a little bit more of a conversation uh, with Bob rather than a death by PowerPoint presentation, which we do from time to time. Uh, we have a couple of topics or questions that we kind of penciled out ahead of time that we'll go over a little bit. But really, today's about the audience. So everyone that is joining us today, please uh, add any questions that you may have through uh, the chat function. So once uh, Bob and I are done kind of talking about the things that uh, we had penciled out originally, uh, it's definitely the time to ask the master. So uh, with that, uh, I won't do Bob's background justice, but he's been a cop for almost 30 years. He's been in the canine world for, I think, what, over 40? Uh, definitely uh, a huge expert. And again, we're so honored to have you today. But Bob, I'll turn it over to you to just kind of let everybody know about your background, um, and then we'll jump in. Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, I don't even know where to start, really. Uh, <laughs> I did 28 years as a police officer out on the west coast of Canada. Uh, I've been in the Canada world for more than 40 years now. Um, during my tenure there, I basically started the dog unit, so I've been kind of where everybody else is has been where you started off with nothing and you worked your way up and you were out selling t-shirts on the street corners to try to make it happen and <laughs> uh, and built my way up from there. So I've come from the bottom up. Uh, during my period of time, I, I was very blessed uh, after I wrote my first couple of books, I, I started off something called the International Police Canine Conference. And I have to, I have to credit a lot of the knowledge that I have um, some of it I've, I've tweaked, but I don't think there's anything in my repertoire that I've done that hasn't come from somebody else that knows way more than I do. And with the International Police Canine Conference, I surrounded myself with 18 team members that I felt were, uh, that I handpicked that were some of the top in the country. And we traveled North America for 20 years and put on this conference. It was a hands-on conference. And the big blessing for me is that I got to go hands-on during that period of time with just under, uh, just under we figure about 4,000 dogs and dog handlers. And it allowed me the opportunity to learn from everybody else that was out there. So um, that's, that's basically where I grew the most from, as well as my street experience deploying dogs on the street. Uh, as far as traveling, I've, I spent a lot of time over in Europe. Uh, I developed the uh, first explosive stock program. It wasn't just me. I was actually just managing it, but it was a joint effort between the United States and Canada to go down and do the first explosive stock um, groups for the country of Brazil just prior to the 2007 Pan American Games. Uh, I have also been in the States quite a bit. Those of you who know me know that I travel extensively down in the States. I had an opportunity to uh, redevelop the Phoenix, Arizona Police Canine Unit back in 2003. We put them through one of our 12 week, uh, or actually it was a 13 week program down there and, and got them into tracking profiles. So I'm not sure if they're even still doing it now, but um, that was quite a challenge for us as well at that particular time. So that's basically a, a bird's eye view of kind of where I come from. Um, Ryan, where do you want to start? Do we have any questions that anybody's got to start off with? I want this to be about the people that are here, not just about me being a talking head. You and I discussed this, and I'm wondering if anybody has got 
a direction that they want us to start off with or if you've got some questions we want to go uh sure well actually um we have our first question um from C Green and it just says, as a hopeful future canine handler in a small law enforcement agency, what advice would you give to get a leg up on the competition? <laughs> Which that's, is that's, pretty much what the, we're talking about all day today, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, pretty much the ultimate question right there. Um, I think it boils down to making sure from the, from the agency perspective, they wanna make sure that they get the best candidate. And, for the position. And the one thing that, that we see as far as litigation, and I know this sounds like it's going way off, but it really isn't. Uh, as far as litigation and problems that we run into as far as bad bites on the street when it comes to patrol dogs, is we see handlers that make bad decisions. And the vast majority of litigation is directly related uh, to bad choices by dog handlers. And so what we're looking for is we want to have, find handlers that are extremely well balanced. So when you're applying for a position, you'll hear all this, this advice about things such as get out and decoy or, or lay tracks for your handlers that are out there or for neighboring handlers, log all that information down of what you're doing in those particular training events, the number of hours that you're putting in and so on and so forth, because that will all start to build you um, a bit of a resume that is canine specific and canine related. Having said that, at the same time, what, what they're gonna look for is they're gonna look at your stability as far as on the road is concerned. A good, a good uh, canine manager is gonna go to your current supervisors and ask directly what type of performance level you have on the street. And canine officers need to be hunters. So if you're a high producer on the road, you're out there, you're checking people, you're pulling over vehicles, um, and, and you're, when I say aggressive, I don't mean it in a negative way, but you're aggressive in the way that you um, get out there and work. You're, you've got a strong uh, work ethic. That's gonna go an enormously long ways when it comes to getting selected. Um, we're gonna get into it probably a little bit during this discussion, but we wanna look for levelers. So you want somebody that's willing to accept that maybe they've made a mistake and they need to improve and they're looking for ways to improve. They're not looking for excuses to get out of a mistake that they've made. Um, that goes a long ways. Um, the, I think the level, the leveler pro, uh, type of personality is, is what we're looking for. And we're gonna discuss the tier modes as we get into this a little bit further. Uh, ho hopefully that answers the question. That's definitely one of uh, the great questions. And, and you kind of talk about well-balanced and you mentioned specifically liability. I suspect, especially for those of us are, that are in, still in the police side of things, you as a supervisor or you being on the selection board for a handler are definitely looking at their history, not only their training, but their use of force. Absolutely. So you know what? There's not a police officer out there talking from the, from the law enforcement aspect there's not a police officer out there that hasn't had some level of a, of a complaint lobbied <laughs> against them, right? If you're out there doing your job, yes. you're going to find somebody out there that you're going to upset and you're going to have complaints against you. And that's normal. What we do want to avoid is a number of unnecessary use of force complaints. That's what's going to be looked at. Uh, if your slate's clean on that, uh, or if it's been found to be unfounded, uh, you're out there doing your job and you're going to run into this. And a good supervisor will be able to recognize and be able to make the difference between somebody out there who is really proactive and working and has the odd citizen's complaint maybe that they've had to deal with, as opposed to somebody out there who's not doing anything, is non-productive, but doesn't have any citizen's complaint. For me, I'll take the officer that's got the citizen's complaint any day of the week. Awesome. Very good. Well, and kind of on that same note, we're, we're talking about some of the qualities that, that you guys are looking for in handlers prior to a oral board and whatnot. And in your book, you specifically have a table. Uh, and of course, when I do the edit, I'll, I'll put the uh, table up for everyone to see. But kind of talking more about the, the basic standards, some of the basic requirements and 
the desired traits that you as, as a canine supervisor, or sergeant, or lieutenant are looking for, uh, for from the applicants as, as we start that process down the road to become a handler. Can you expand a little bit about some of those? Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna vary depending on the individual department, the individual state, where they're coming from, and the type of job they're doing, what the, the performance standards are for that particular area. However, there should be some things that are pretty standard. Uh, we for us in my agency, we prefer to have somebody that had a minimum of three years service on the road. And the reason for that is a lot of times when you're out and you're doing an extended track and maybe you've gone for a track that's gone eight, 10, 12 blocks, you're in a, an area where you're jumping over fences and so on and so forth while you're pursuing a particular individual and trying to track them down, you can find yourself all of a sudden in somebody's backyard uh, in a major fight for your life with your dog and you're trying to get on the radio at the same time you're fist fighting with somebody and try to explain or describe where you're at. And so one of the big valuable things is we wanna have at least a little bit of road experience um, under our belts before we basically go on the road. So we know our area. So we know where we're at all the time. Also that minimum of three years affords the department um, three years of service to be able to look into how you normally perform, what your performance levels are like, what your uh, use of force complaints, if any, are like. Um, they get to know you. So they kind of know who you are when you come in to apply for that position. They've got a little bit of background. If they're doing it sooner than that, it's, it makes it tough. And in some agencies, I know there's a minimum of five years. Uh, but then again, you also want to pick handlers that are young enough uh, into the job that they still have time to perform as a as a good dog handler uh, because it is a specialty field and maybe go for a second dog if it's if it, that's something that the the department will allow uh, and still have time enough later on in their career to be able to be promoted or to go into something else. Uh, so a lot of it there's a lot of it that has to to come into play there. Uh, we want as we talked about it before we want minimal citizens complaints but having a citizen complaint or two is not going to knock you out of the out of the ballpark uh, and also the same thing when it comes to use of force complaints you might have a use of force complaint you might have some incident where it might be legitimate but if it's not if it's one of the, those things it's an aberration as opposed to the norm would that take you out of the play for me depends on who else is online and what their qualifications are uh, so those will be some of the basics um, that you would look at um, when we apply for the position, we want our officers to go through a, a first aid course, or at least have a home uh, or a basic uh, foundation of first aid, if at all possible. Um, we also don't want officers that, and this is, should be obvious, but are prone to a lot of sick time. Uh, canine handlers are prone to injury by the nature of what they do. They're taking bites, they're jumping over fences, they're fist fighting with bad guys. Uh, they're dealing with the worst of the worst and the most violent crimes, usually on a regular basis. Uh, so as a result, they've got to be capable of handling themselves. And sometimes you'll find that in some agencies, there are those handlers out there that think it's cool to have a dog in the back of the car. We'll go out and do the public demos, we'll do the odd call, but really they're non-productive. And we want to try and weed those out. And some of those same officers are those that will, uh, you book off a lot of sick time. And that can be a bit of a red flag for, for uh, supervisors that are looking at, at bringing somebody on board. We want to have somebody that's in good physical condition. And I know that's a tough one because in, in some areas, they don't like to have those standards because it goes against uh, what some people feel um, is right, you know, if I'm not quite in good enough shape, why should that preclude me from getting in? When I was on, uh, we had to do the same basic testing as we did as the day that we applied for the position. We had to go through the same uh, academy uh, testing that we did in a, for physical agility and physical testing uh, and pass that with the addition of the ability to lift an 80 pound bag over a, a six foot wall. Um, on top of everything else. And we had to do that annually to make sure that we were kept in, in shape uh, to be able to do the job. 
This is not only to make sure that you can do the job, but this is for your own good as well. Um, I've been in a, a lot of situations uh, with any of my dogs. There were times when I was dealing with somebody that basically were able to defeat my dog and almost me at the same time and other officers. You get into some very, very violent situations. And the way that you're gonna stay alive and you're gonna go home to the end, at the end of the shift to your family is to make sure that you're physically capable of doing the job. Uh, strong report rating skills. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of reports. Uh, maintaining reports is vital when it comes to canine. I know that uh, most agencies now have body cam, but you still need to put that information down on paper. It will come up in court cases and it's vital that you be able to articulate yourself well and then not only articulate yourself well on paper, but also present yourself well as you articulate that same information in a courtroom. Um, so those are the types of things that you want to look for. So as a supervisor, I might even go visit uh, a, a courtroom at a period of time when a particular officer might be giving testimony, even just on an impaired driving case, just to sort of see what they're like on the stand and so on and so forth. It all depends as to what, uh, what the breakdown is. Um, and the other thing is night shifts. Uh, I got into the dog unit and subsequently worked 16 years of street night shifts. Uh, that's when we were needed. That's when we were busiest. And uh, so that, that can take its toll and you've got to be willing to, uh, to perform at that level. Um, Ryan, I'll, I'll take a break at that and see if there's somewhere else, what direction you want to go. Sure. Uh, we do have one question, but before we get to the question, just on the same topic that we're talking about, a couple other things that you've mentioned in the past as well is kind of that stable home life. And then also is, is the home compatible uh, for having a dog. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of what those supervisors are looking for, for those canine handler applicants. What exactly are they looking for when they say stable home life? Or is your home uh, ready for a dog? Do you look at people that have five dogs already, you know, pet dogs in a different way or small children? How do you look at that when it comes to applicants? Again, it depends on the individual department because it's going to vary and it depends on what the tolerance level is for each department. Um, number one, as far as physical aspect is concerned, you want to have a fenced in yard and you want to have it fenced, not at three feet, but you want to have a good six foot fence around it preferably something that's not going to be enticing for the dog to look through and be able to get enticed over that fence at any particular time. Most won't jump over a fence like that, but it's better if it's, it's closed off and if at all possible. You want to have an area that allows the dog to, if you want to go out and throw a ball, you can toss them around. You can always take them off site if you have to, but uh, you want to have a bit of yard space for the dog to be able to go out and do a bit of running around if you're on a day off. Uh, and one that's large enough, of course, to accept a, a kennel in the back. So as far as uh, physical facilities, you also want to have, and I noticed there's a lot of these, uh, matter of fact, there was one recently posted on Facebook book where they had uh, these beautiful new kennels. Some of them are just gorgeous that are out there, but it depends on where you're at because you also want to have a facility where uh, the dog has got the ability to live in a dog house that's inside a kennel or attached to a kennel where the dog's body heat has got the ability to heat that compartment according to whatever level of um, weather that you've got in your particular area. A lot of times people buy these great big huge dog houses and put them out there and the dog goes inside the dog house for shelter, but he's got no way to keep warm because it's a great big uninsulated facility that he's in. Um, so it depends on what your, uh, what your needs are for your particular area is what you wanna look at. As far as neighbors are concerned, it's, there's no harm in, in talking to the neighbors and seeing how they feel about it. I don't think that neighbors, it's really any of their business what you do, but you also wanna have a heads up as to what you might be dealing with down the road if you do give this individual a, a dog. It's always good to just sort of knock on doors and do a little bit of PR and see how the neighbors feel about it. Children at home, not an issue. I don't see that an issue. Uh, in today's world, we have the ability to kennel our dogs outside consistently if we need to. Um, you want to be careful. Every, every dog is different. Uh, there's some that, that uh, you wouldn't want anywhere near children. There's others that um, you, you don't have that much of an issue with, but it, you should never, of course, uh, leave a dog alone with any children ever. Uh, it's, just, it's just 
one of those things that we can't predict, no matter how gentle we think the animals are. Um, as far as home life is concerned, dogs or other pets you were asking about, um, I don't see that as being a major issue. I, I really don't. Um, if there's a conflict between the dogs, I can see that creating an issue, but I don't ever see an issue as far as uh, a police dog being raised side by side, a family pet. Uh, the two just sort of, uh, they're not gonna have problems as long as they get along well, you're not gonna have an issue. And a lot of it also depends as to whether you're gonna kennel that dog outside or if you can allow it free, for, free run of the house. If there's gonna be potential conflict, then a decision has to be made there. Um, finally, the family has to be on board. And most importantly, the significant other. The husband, the wife, the significant other, whoever it is, um, they need to be on board and understand that things are gonna change. Uh, your world is gonna change. Um, you're gonna miss Thanksgiving. You're gonna miss some Christmases. You're gonna get called out in the middle of the night. Shifts are gonna be very strange at times. Um, and they have to understand that. There's gonna be that time when when that dog, maybe the handler is off on a course. I'm just telling you this because, um, because this is one that happened with me and my dog was left at home. Uh, it was an unrelated to canine course that I was on. My dog was left at home and uh, I phoned home one night to find out that uh, uh, my dog had uh, somehow eaten a ham that was left on, and it was a <laughs> ham apparently that was left on top of a counter. And of course, subsequently had <clears throat> gotten sick. These things are going to occur, no matter how careful you are, it's going to occur. Um, and so as a result, the wife has to be understanding, the husband has to be understanding, the significant other has to be understanding that these things might happen um, and be willing to, to put up with some of the, the negative side of it that might occur. Um, Excellent stuff. So that's just sort of an overall, but hopefully that'll, that'll run some ideas. Excellent. Uh, so the next question up is from, I'm going to butcher this name, but Kay uh, Chanaki, who says, how do you know if a handler is a good match with a canine and what do you do if they don't mesh well? Good question. So we've, for, for many, many years, we did, uh, we, we, as trainers, we've teamed dogs with handlers. And for years as a trainer, you kind of just know who suits who and so on and so forth. Um, as a good trainer, it is not wise for me to go out and pick a dog that I would like to work because I like a high-speed dog. I'm not dumb enough to take a Malinois just for the record. I, you know, I like high-speed dogs, but I still like, I won't the, tell my you know, Malinois. Just, yeah, I, I won't, you know, there's be a lot of people hate me for saying that, but it's not my style, okay? Fair but, enough. But the personality of the handler and the personality of the dog have got to have some compatibility. Um, and there's, there's very significant reasons for that. And then years ago, I was struggling with some training, some officers, and I, I thought I'd lost my, my tack for training. And... I had a very close friend of mine um, by the name of Dr. Steve McKenzie. And I phoned Steve out in New York and I said, Steve, I need some help here. This is what I got going. And I don't, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So I invited him to come out to the West Coast of Canada to train with me. And he came and he spent a week. And he said to me, well, after he'd spent some time with us, he says, you got a bunch of blamers. So I said, okay, what are you talking about? And he got into what, Ryan, you and I discussed earlier the satire modes. And basically the satire modes that were developed by a lady by the name of Elizabeth Satir. She's since passed away. Uh, she was a psychologist and she was into family intervention and, and assisting families as well as work intervention and, and conflicts in, in the workplace as well. And he, play, he used satire modes to place people in certain categories. And so if you have a blamer, uh, if you have a distractor, if you have somebody that is a computer type personality, all these different types of personalities that they have, 
um, affect uh, how they're going to perform with the dog. So, for example, and you'd have to, I've got it all written down in the book, and I've actually, just Ryan, I don't want to take everybody's time with it, but I did bring the PowerPoint up, and I've got it available if we decide that we want to get into it later on. But basically, okay. you've got somebody that's a high alpha driven male, and you've got a high alpha male dog, and you put those two together, there's a very good likelihood that you're going to have conflict. There's nothing wrong with a very driven dog and a very driven handler being together, but that driven handler has got to understand that they can't be hammering that dog all the time or that dog's going to come up the line and it's going to eat them. That's, it's as simple as that. There's going to be conflict between the handler and the dog. If you have somebody that's more of a leveler personality, they can still be a fairly you know alpha type personality, but they are a leveler. They understand what the dog is all about and they can adjust accordingly. That's going to give you a better prospect for a good quality team. So a good trainer should be able to see what the personality of the dog is and what the personality of the handler is. If you have a, a, a less than adequate dog, in other words, if you end up getting stuck with a dog that's not a strong dog and mm -hmm. the dog is, you know, uh, fairly, the dog will perform and do the job, but not a really, really strong dog. And you give that dog to a blamer type personality or somebody that's always the dog's fault or either blaming everybody for things that, that happen, you're going to have, they, they're going to suppress that dog. You need somebody that's willing to bring that dog out of its shell and somebody that's willing to, to be very animated and supportive. And that's where we look for what we refer to as this level or type personality. So it's a matter of looking for somebody that's got a level type personality that can work with a, a very strong dog or has got the ability to work with virtually any level of dog. Um, if you have somebody that's a kind of um, uh, a laid back person that's not very, uh, a placator is what we refer to them as, and they're not very secure in themselves and they end up getting hired on as a dog handler and you give them any kind of a dog, it's not gonna work. Uh, they just are not gonna be able, the dog is gonna rule the roost and do whatever it wants. And they're not gonna have the ability to take control of the situation and deal with the dog. So personality types of people play a large part in how to match those dogs together. If you run into a match that doesn't work, you as a supervisor have to make a decision as to whether to wash out the dog, if it's the dog that's the problem. If it's a leveler type personality though, it's likely not the dog that's the problem. It could be, you might have a weak dog in some areas. And at that point, you've got to make a decision on the dog, but you might have to have a serious look at washing out the handler and replacing that handler. Excellent. And for those of you that have the book, what we're talking about is on page 146. And I, I have to tell you, I mean, I've been doing canine for 20 years and I've probably paired, I don't know, three or four dozen teams together. And we all kind of, as trainers, have those gut feelings. What you lay out here in the book, specifically with the Satir model, is amazing. It, it really narrows it down and gives us as trainers and program managers a great model to follow. So thank you for putting that in there. And thank you for talking about it today. You know, it's Doc McKenzie that gets the credit for that. Um, I'm sad that he's gone. But the, the fact is, is that we were doing it, I think, before as trainers, Ryan. But by using the Satir model, it, it allowed us to sort of put it in the slots that made it easier to understand when we start teaching handlers or, or having other trainers uh, understand, Absolutely. you know, putting those teams together. And I, I, it, it's really helped me to understand it. And it really helped some handlers even look at themselves. Um, it's quite interesting when people, when you start talking about satire modes, handlers look at themselves and how many, how many people have you heard yell at the dog or stupid, you know, stupid dog, stupid, you know, a stupid dog just doesn't get it. Absolutely. You know? And it's not the stupid dog. It's the handler has not settled back and really thought and got into the dog's head to understand what the issue is. And, but I can understand the frustration, but a good level handler will say, you know, we're doing something wrong here. we got to figure out a solution to this. And there's usually, usually the solution is a little bit easier than what you might think. If you can just get into the head of the dog and get it sorted out. Absolutely. And the way you describe it and from the, from the doctor, as you said, it makes it so much easier to concentrate on those things because it's, it's so well codified and almost quantifiable at, at that point. So yeah, it's easy to identify when you, when you understand satir modes and you understand the combinations. Um, yeah, it becomes pretty easy. Yeah. And as a sergeant of a canine unit, sometimes you have to explain 
your decisions to a lieutenant or a captain. And it's tough when you go into the captain's office with a gut feeling as opposed to, hey, here's a model that we're following. This is what I'm seeing. So I right. love it. Um, we got another question here. Let me get down to it. Um, so in a small town like mine, uh, with permission from admin, of course, how would you go about contacting larger agencies uh, and let them know that you are available uh, for use with your dog if they should need? So basically almost an MOU question. Uh, and then, or would you just steer clear of offering altogether? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I would, I would encourage it. Um, where you're going to get kickback or pushback from the administrators is, and it's that old thing, they all run liability scared. Instead of being <laughs> liability aware, they have a tendency to run liability scared. And I understand that in this day and age, but if you're a level-headed handler and you know what you're doing and you're good at what you do, there's no reason why you shouldn't be trying to go out there and utilize your dog as much as possible because the benefits are not only for the agency that you're supporting, the benefit is gonna to come to you in experience. Every Absolutely. dog call is different. So every time you deploy enhances the abilities of yourself as well as the abilities of the dog. So I would encourage it. And the one thing that I would say, and you know, when I did, when I did the book, it, I tried to uh, do it in such a way that it was just uh, straight out up and up just the way it is as I saw it. And one of the things that you have to do as a dog handler a lot of time is you have to get your management team involved and get them interested so that they'll go to bat for you and it'll become kind of like their idea that you should have this MOU because so much you get so much pushback from administration these days because they're, they're run liability scared and most of them just don't have the opportunity to understand what canine is all about because they've never had the experience of running a dog themselves so they have a tendency to to throw the hands up and say, oh, let's slow down here a little bit. But as long as you can articulate yourself well and show them that there's a purpose behind it, and then it will benefit the department as well as the department that you're assisting, you know, you get them involved and get them to support you and get them to help you make contact with that other agency and, and see if you can assist uh, when they need it, because it will benefit both agencies greatly. Absolutely. And just my little two cents in there, I was with a very small agency with few uh, canine calls of our own, but we were also on call for 12 other agencies in the surrounding counties. I got far more experience working those than I would have ever in my small town. Yeah, it's the so. same thing here. I mean, I was we were OK as far as busyness is concerned, but we bordered on a place called Surrey, British Columbia. And, you know, it's almost like there was an invisible wall between us. That 120th Street was a divider between our county, our, our municipality, we call them where we're at, and their municipality. Uh, they were supposed to be running 13 dog teams for their agency at any given time throughout my entire career. I never saw them any more than seven. Uh, and so, and it was a shooting gallery over there. So we were constantly wow. running calls over there. And I, I credit a lot of my experience from the calls that I did over for Surrey RCMP. Um, a lot of my hands-on experience came by, by that MOU. Excellent. Uh, I have another question from Nathan Houston. Uh, it says, what are you looking for with officer behavior, such as will an officer with a moody temperament affect the dog as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, right if down the leash. Somebody, yeah, that's, you need somebody that is as level as you possibly can. Uh, you want an officer that's a self-initiator um, and, and that is comfortable with the dog. If they, it sounds like if you've got somebody that's moody, uh, you might be dealing with somebody that's maybe got a little bit of a blamer personality type in there. Um, and that's you've got to have somebody that's patient as well. Patience is an enormous thing when you're training a dog and when you're working a dog. Um, you know, we're really kind of divided. We're police officers and then we're dog trainers. But that's not where it ends. It's not separate. Those two have to mesh together and come together in a way that the dog understands you and you understand the dog. That dog, by the time you're training, and if your training is done properly, you shouldn't be in training mode when you hit the streets. And that takes a lot of patience and time to be able to develop. And if there's somebody that, that is moody, it's gonna be frustrating for the dog because they don't know, the dog isn't gonna understand that if the officer is upset for some reason, uh, if they're inconsistent, 
This is not a healthy thing for the dog and the dog doesn't understand what's going on. So the dog is always gonna be uh, going through the same kind of routines where it's pulling back sometimes and other times maybe it's ready to go, but other times it's pulling back and there shouldn't, you know, concerned about maybe what's gonna happen. Uh, depends on what the attitude of the handler is. And, and so uh, somebody that's moody is not somebody that, that I would look at if I had other options. Excellent. And of all the various qualities that we can be looking at of prospective handlers, would you say, I know it's hard to pick one, but would patience be at least one of the most important qualities that you're looking for through an oral board or an applicant process? I, I would say patience would be one of the more paramount uh, attributes you would want to have somebody because it, it takes patience and time, particularly if you have a dog that's got a, a major training issue. You need somebody that's willing to have the patience and, and being consistent uh, over time. And that's only gonna come through patience and, and being able to be patient enough to get those reps in over and over and over again without getting frustrated. That's, that's key. Excellent. Have another question for you from Kevin. Uh, Kevin is asking, in your experience, what is the biggest hurdle to overcome for a new handler? Trust in your dog. Um, I think once you hit the street, it's a matter of understand that if you have gone through a good training program, and not all training programs are equal, and we don't do in Canada, we're not like you are in the States in a lot of ways, in that you go through a lot of um, uh, vendors that you don't get enough time with. They might have the knowledge to be able to give it to you, but you're not there long enough to really feel comfortable by the time you hit the road. With us, it's 14 weeks. We're trained by another police agency or somebody within our police agency, and we get eight hours a day for 14 weeks. And it's and if the dog doesn't work out, we could get up to eight week level, and the dog hits a plateau, and we realize that this isn't going to make it. We start at week one again with a new dog, and we get another 14 weeks. So we've got the the blessings and the advantages of being able to to have that. Um, so. I must say that is very rare here in the States that only right. your really large agencies do that, but the vast majority of canine units on the street are coming from small vendors where you're lucky if you get a three to four week handler school with, I think the vast majority around, you know, two to three. Correct. And that's come on. And again, I go, th I went through the history of this is that came on back in the seventies and up until the 70s, everybody did it the same way as we were doing it or that we're doing it here in Canada. And it never changed until somebody got a business brainstorm and went to town on <laughs> it. And since then, I can honestly say that in today's day and age, we have better equipment, we have better training ability, we have way more knowledge on canine behavior, and yet we have more lawsuits and the dogs don't do nearly as much as what we were able to do back in the 80s and the 90s you know, with, with the training that we do if we went through a 12 or 14 week school. Uh, it's just in a lot of areas, uh, one of the major ones that I'm really discouraged about because it's your bread and butter in my opinion, uh, and you normally come in with way more bad guys when you do it, is the tracking profile. That talent has been lost in so many areas of so many agencies that just don't do it. And uh, that's our forte, that's my bread and butter, that's what I do. And I'd come home and without, we didn't have helicopter support. And I'd come home probably sometimes up to as much as 35% of the time, I would come home with my bad guy. That's actually a pretty good rate. Absolutely. And you've got very limited containment and you're, you're tracking through the city or uh, whatever it is. Some days I'd, I'd be up even better, but it's a matter of, um, I don't know, pulling it all together somehow. So uh, you can function under in the areas that you're at under the conditions that you're working in. And, and so back to Kevin's question, is it fair to say that it's tough to really pick what the biggest hurdle is because much of that depends. Did you get that 14 week initial training as opposed to, did you only get two? So yeah, let's get back to that. I, yeah, I go back to, it's a matter of trusting your dog. Get, when you get back out on the road and you start doing stuff, Consistency is key. And well, you want to get into hurdles? I got all sorts of them. <laughs> uh, I got all sorts of them. 
but it's a matter of you've you've been trained and, and one of the things that you've got to understand is that you've got to get to the point at some point in time you don't know where the track goes or you don't know where the dope is heading you've got to trust that your dog is going to tell it to you you've got to trust what the dog is telling you learn how to read it uh, but then when I talked about hurdles, you can take that different directions, Ryan, because one of the major hurdles of any police department in this day and age, to be quite frank, and there's going to be a lot here that are in supervisory capacity, you're not going to like what I say this, but it's management. It is support. Absolutely. It is, it is true support from, from the, the management team. Um, the officers don't get the support that they need. They don't get the training time or they don't get the equipment that they need. Uh, and I understand budgets are tight, but that's one of the major hurdles is trying to get management on board. And you know what's really interesting is that when you get your management board on team or when you start really, really producing and the management board starts to understand and see that you're, you're always called out for public demos. You're the primary public demonstration Absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, aspect to that department. And you bring so much to the, to the table when it comes to your relationship, which right now in this day and age, is vital your relationship with the public as a police officer and canine can do that and that's huge there's so many things it reduces the amount of of detective time that is used to to uh, uh, complete files if i've got a, a homicide that's taking place or armed robbery and i take my dog and deploy my dog and i catch them right then and there how many hundreds of hours have i saved of detective time multiple detectors out trying to track down who that individual was that committed that crime, right? So Absolutely. there's so many benefits. When, when management starts to realize the power and capability that these dog teams have and maybe loosen the purse strings a little bit, which is another major hurdle, okay? Then at that point, things start to happen. And when you've got management working with the canine teams and looking at them as one of the, the, the preferred sections of the department, you get productivity like it's going out of style. So that's another hurdle, but that's not a hurdle sometimes that handlers have got any control over. It depends on how their relationship is with their management team. Fair enough. And even if they don't have control, it's still a hurdle that they have to overcome sometimes or at least be aware of. Right. So excellent stuff. Um, all right. We've got uh, another question actually uh, from a friend of mine, Mohammed, uh, who is in Malaysia. Uh, he is setting up a new search and rescue unit for the civil defense there. Uh, what type of handlers or what is the selection process uh, to follow? Is there handler criteria? Is it the same as what you would look at from a patrol or police side? Or do you have some advice on the, the nuances between a search and rescue handler versus a police officer? You know what? I don't think the selection would be any real different, except that I don't think you have to worry quite as much about um, the aggressive side of things. Um, because right. It's not really rescue, use of force. Exactly. You don't have to worry about that side of it. So that's one aspect that you don't have to look at, look, you know, to, to be concerned about quite as much. Um, you still want to have somebody that's a good leveling type personality, somebody that's going to be able to bring out the best in the dog. Um, the other thing too is the the dogs or the, the type of work that they do there as well, the physical side of it may be very different. There may be a lot of long-term hiking and that type of thing. Although I don't even see that as being much different from a handler that's, you know, running a mile or two, tracking a bad guy through the woods or, or jumping over fences. So I don't see that there's a huge difference when it comes to selectability. I, I would say it's probably very similar. Now I may be corrected on that because I've never been deployed basically search and rescue. I've taught search and rescue teams as far as tracking and area searches and all that kind of stuff is concerned, but I've never been on a search and rescue team. So um, I, I have to put that caveat on there, but Fair enough. off the top of my head, I can't see it being as, as a lot of difference. And somewhat to Mohammed's question here, as far as the process for applicants uh, in general, I know, you know, obviously we've both been through them and we've been sat on them. Uh, as far as oral boards, but the process, do you normally take resumes and applications and then move people forward into an oral board? And then who do you normally select for those oral boards? Are they handlers or other supervisors or outside of canine? How do you so, go about that? All right. So what, what we've done in the past is we will select 
at least one handler, usually a senior handler off the group that is currently out there working. So we can see how they can inter, interrelate with them. But I'll throw out something else that's a little interesting is that you can actually run two interview processes. If you want to get down to it, get down dirty, it's a good process to go through for any agency, regardless of it be search and rescue or law enforcement. What that is, is you have a management or the actual, your, your team that's going to do the actual final selection process. So what I'll do for that is there might be the canine supervisor. There might be somebody from management if they choose to, to put somebody in, although it's not vital. Uh, I might want to bring in, if I'm not, uh, if I'm a canine supervisor that doesn't have a lot of experience and has got no canine background, I might bring in a canine handler that's, or, or a supervisor from another department to come and sit in on it and be a part of that oral board as well. Um, it, de it depends as to what direction you want to go with it. But at the same time, after having that management oral board, I'll set a second date. And what I'll do is I'll have a peer group oral board. So you get a, a series of questions that are asked by those who would end up being your peers as you go through that process and you put the, the results together. And that peer group would be run probably by the senior canine handler, as well as however many other canine handlers that are going to be uh, within the department or maybe an adjacent department to find out how that person relates to the ideas that he's putting across to those other canine officers. Excellent. And I know in the book, I think it's page 129 or 130, you have a section there that is basically entitled, uh, So You Want to Be a Canine Handler. Right. Uh, and you kind of talk about bringing in potential applicants on their time off to kind of talk about it or perhaps shadow handlers and see the less than glamorous side of, of being a handler. Right. So I'm just going to, what I'll do is I'm going to just show you a uh, I, I brought this up here just uh, I'll just show you what it's what it's like here. Uh, this is a typical example of what we did. And all it is is it's it's showing you kind of what the expectations are. And we would invite the officer to come on their own time because number one, by doing it on their own time, are they willing to take their own time to come and do this? So it's not required. so it it gets around any of those, agencies like under certain state laws you know unless you're paying me and i'm not showing up kind of routine. right it's voluntary so we say hey on your own time if you're interested you know you can make it just a little silent note of who's on you know who's actually showing up to do it we invite them to bring their significant other with them okay and the reason for this is because a lot of times when they go home after the lecture and it doesn't take very long it's only a few slides after they go home, they start talking about it. And we start talking about the, you know, the odd weird thing that happens with the dog getting sick on the living room floor and so on and so forth. When it comes up in discussions, they go home and they say, well, you know, we're not going to be spending a lot of time together on Thanksgiving, maybe. And I'm not so sure I want to sacrifice that. So we find that there are some handlers that actually remove themselves from the competition and save you from running into issues that might have come up later on down the road when they Absolutely. start running into conflicts as a result. So there's some beneficials to this. So to give you an idea here, I'll just really quickly run through them. We want, in this case- oh, this is great, long. this is excellent. Okay, a minimum of three years of patrol service. Now you must have the ability to work with a minimum of supervision because you're out there and you're making hardcore decisions on your own, a lot of times without a supervisor. Now, there, there's an aspect where we recommend that you um, have supervisors involved in deployments, but that's a whole nother discussion, okay? Not be the, sub the subject of legitimate excessive force complaints. And like I said, the caveat to that is you might have one, but, you know, it, it might be an aberration. So that has to be taken into account. And sick time not abused. All right. That's pretty easy. It's not, you know, it's pretty straightforward. That's not a major issue for most people. Okay. Now, high caliber from within the department. One of the problems that we used to run into back in the day was that if somebody was a problem on a squad, then the sergeant would recommend that person to go to canine because they're <laughs> looking for a place to dump them. To pawn them, yeah. Yeah, yep. you want to avoid that at all costs. While I'm at that topic, supervisors on a platoon or a squad team, whatever you call it, they are one of your best resources. If you're the supervisor over the canine unit and you're looking at selecting people, 
they are some of your best resources. If you have somebody that's applied for it, go to their supervisors, ask them directly about what their performance level is like. Have a look at what their personnel file is, is looking like as well. But go to the supervisors because a lot of times those supervisors will give you some solid information about the individual and they're a good resource. Somebody that's good with the public. And here again, when I say good with the public, not only are they good with the public, but they wanna be able to, to speak uh, to large groups. If there's somebody that's shy or introverted and they're not willing to, to get out and speak, they might be a great dog handler and you've got to balance that off because they might be a horrible speaker, but be the best selection for this dog position. But you also want to try and find, if at all possible, somebody that's willing to be a representative of your department, somebody that's going to bring you good public and positive PR. That's so important this day and age. And it, it really helps you to build your relationship with your management team because they see newspaper articles are coming out about you that are positive when you're doing these demos. Uh, they see kids coming through the department all the time when they're when they're uh, uh, being brought to the agency to, to watch a dog demo, or you might go out to them to do a dog demo, but it gets back to management and they wanna see that kind of stuff. You wanna be comfortable in front of crowds and you need to be a good public speaker. Very good. Okay, good report writing and record keeping skills are vital. We discussed this real briefly. Again, this is vital. One of the problems that I'm seeing because we run the, the CATS program, the CATS K9 RMS system, one of the things that I see so much, and it bothers me, we see some of these guys that get in the system and they write just absolutely reports that are pertinent, they're succinct, that do the job. And when you go to pull information out of it, you know that when they go to court, those lawyers are go that they are going up against, they don't have a chance because what they've put in that records keeping system has got it down cold and they've filled out what they need to fill out to get the job done. If they see slots that they don't feel they want to use, they can leave them blank. But the point is, is they've done a good job of doing it. On the other side, we see so many reports where they'll fill out what they're doing, the time that they're doing it, and there's nothing more in there. Then they go to court. And what happens is I get a call from a supervisor who says, Bob, your system isn't working. We can't pull our reports. So I'll say, well, let's log in and have a look. So we log in and have a look. And what it boils down to is that the Dog handlers are not writing any reports. They're putting in the bare minimums. They're not putting in a proper training objective. They're not putting in the proper narratives and summaries and so on and so forth that they need to put in to actually document what they're doing. And this puts them in a situation when they go to court, they've got nothing to protect them. There's nothing there to back them up. It becomes a he says, she says when it comes to the courtroom. And you'll fail every time when you do that. No record keeping. And I don't care whether you're on CATS, pack track. Uh, canine tracks, any of these other ones, I don't care what system you're on, use it to the best of your ability. Some will do better than others. Some will guide you better than others and will have different things in it that they feel is the best. But it's up to you ultimately to put your information in there. And if you don't, you're leaving yourself out to, to really not only um, losing your court case, but also potential litigation down the road. And just so that you know, I had a case that I worked on. Uh, it was out of the state of Arizona. Uh, we basically did really well on it. Uh, I was asked to come in as an expert witness on that. And what it boiled down to though, is the officer that was there was on the lawsuit along with the sheriff of that particular county, but his wife was named as a separate individual to that same lawsuit. And I guess at the time, I assuming they still can in the state of Arizona, simply because of the marriage, they could name the wife as part of a dog bite lawsuit. Wow. And, and I fought that one like there's, I didn't know whether we were gonna come out on top of that one, but we did. But Excellent. it's one of those things that your records are what ultimately are gonna make the difference, okay? And again, we wanna have people that are in good physical condition. Uh, best hanging on officer is a person who is an aggressive, proactive street, street cop. And I'm, when I say aggressive here, I mean in a positive way. Somebody that's out there pounding the beat and doing what they can to, to find bad guys. They must be a customer service oriented individual. In other words, when somebody calls you for a dog call, you want to respond right now. You want to be on top of it. Matter of fact, when you hear something that there may be a B&E in progress or uh, somebody to check an alarm, you should be volunteering and letting them know that you're on the way. That's the type of person that they're looking for. 
that type of person is who a canine handler should be. And as a street cop, that's the type of street cop I want to look for when I'm looking to get onto or pull somebody into my, my program. An officer who's open to new ideas, accepts responsibility well, and shows patience and tolerance towards others. And it, it, this is very important. You've got to have somebody that's willing to basically call the shots and, and call it as it is. Um, if you make a mistake, you own up to it um, and you do what it takes to make yourself better and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. That's just basically be an adult. Uh, and, and you want to be able to show that you're willing to work with others and that you have the self-discipline enough that when you're made, given an assignment, uh, that you're going to see it through and you're going to get the job done. And not only are you going to get it done, but it's going to get done well. And that's what we're looking for. Excellent. Okay. You want somebody who's pro professional and calm under stressful situations and able to think on their feet. And, and again, this goes without saying, you are going to be going to every in-progress call that's an armed robbery, a shooting, a rape that's just occurred, or you know whatever's in progress, you're going to go to that. And you're going to find yourself in some very tenuous situations where in a split second, and I'm dealing one, with one right now, another case that I'm on, uh, right now where I understand why the dog handler sent the dog. But in this case, the timing wasn't right. And so it's going to get get them into trouble and that split second made all the difference in the world so we've got to be able to to be calm and not just react because we're stressed or because we're upset we've got to be able to maintain that um that integrity of of uh, maintaining a level sort of even keel under stress under pressure we want to have some aptitude with animals and ryan you talked about this before we might get into this a little bit later but you know what um you have these guys that are traffic. Tra oh, here we go. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to say it. But I had an officer that was a, a traffic, uh, a traffic cop, uh, excellent guy, good friend of mine, and he wanted to be a dog handler. And he came on, uh, wasn't selected by me. I want to put that caveat in there. He was <laughs> to be by management, and I was uh, directed to train him. And but he had no aptitude with animals. You know, he didn't. He didn't. Um, bond with the dog he tried uh but he it was like he was his car it was armor all all the time the boots were polished and you, you need to get out there but it, the the focus needs to be on on communication with the animal and just petting the dog uh it was almost like he was very um almost bored like uh uh like there just wasn't any exuberance no gotcha communication and so, and there are people that are like that as much as they want to work with the dog, they just don't have that aptitude. So sometimes you have to take that into consideration. Uh, willing to accept a kennel facility at home, possess a valid first aid certificate, and willing to serve a minimum five years. Um, tactical driving school, driving history, you want to look and see if they've been in a lot of accidents because you're running code to virtually everything. You want to pass physical agility standards, we know about that. And complete, you want to make sure they don't have allergies or asthma. Just a little quiet note so the world knows I am allergic to dogs. As and am I. <laughs> so, so there were times when if I got out into a hay field and got work with my dog and everything else at the same time, eventually you build a bit of bitter resistance. But uh, there was a couple of times I ended up in the hospital getting filled full of uh, atropine. Oh, wow. uh, family considerations, we talked about this. Decisions of the administrator over a particular officer affects the wife and children of the officer involved. In other words, if you are a supervisor and you have to take that dog away down the road because this handler was not appropriate for the position, it's not just the handler that you're punishing. You're punishing his wife, you're punishing his children because they've grown that dog, there becomes a relationship there. And they've got to be in the selection process as well. And this is where we get into the discussion about we would start talking about the bad things that can happen as far as you know little accidents that occur at home and having to get up in the middle of the night take dog to the vet or whatever it is and this is when the family starts to talk between the the, the husband and the wife or the significant others will start to talk to, to one another about it and sometimes where they'll remove themselves from the process when you start to get into these uh types of discussions okay Excellent. And somewhat on the on the same topic here, uh, we have a great question from Taylor Grenier. Um, whoa, I just lost it there. As a prospective handler, 
what other things can I look into studying for the interview process aside from my department's written directives? So besides policy and I would assume case law and first aid, what, what other things should they be studying? Um, you know what? That's, that's a good question. Um, to me, you want to know like your case law, your, your, um, virtually all your, your like your, your care, your, your, uh, uh, Graham versus Connor, uh, Florida versus Harris, all those you want to get into those and know your case law a little bit, especially if you're on an oral board. If you know that stuff, you're going to impress them because it's dog related. Uh, and, and they're going to know that you've actually done a little bit of studying. Uh, the, the sad part is there's not, I don't know what books to recommend because I don't know that there's any other supervisor's manuals out there. Um, <laughs> that would give you some good background, but I don't, this is, I don't want to turn this into a, a sales thing. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else is out there. I think when you work and spend a lot of time with the handlers, you'll get a good sense of what they're all about. You'll get a good understanding of what's going on. The other thing is when you go in to do an interview, understand that when you train a dog, you need to be animated. They might do something crazy. Like one of the things that they, they have done in the past, and I've seen this, they'll toss you a flashlight and they'll say, that flashlight is your dog and he's just done the best drug search that he's ever done in his life. And you're coming back in with 45 kilos of cocaine and a million and a half bucks. Praise your dog for doing it. And the next thing you know, you're down on the floor rolling around, praising a flashlight on the floor. You know, there's some times that I love it. Hey, it sounds dumb, but it, they're, I use that in my oral boards, just yep. so you know. We Our, usually use a stuffed animal. I bring in a stuffed animal dog, and it's the same thing. And we have absolutely failed people for, as you said, petting it like it's a board and just not having that innate ability to do that. So right. I, I love they, that they you brought that up. They can't let go. And sorry, guys, I hate to say this, but I prefer sometimes to train female handlers as opposed to male handlers. And the reason Absolutely. why is because they're not as reserved about having fun with the dog. Uh, guys sometimes are a little bit more reserved. Oh, well, they're getting better. I got to say they're getting better. <laughs> but it's, you know, girls have got no problem hooting and hollering and screaming, uh, you know, and having fun with the dog. Whereas um, the guys are a little bit more reserved than that. It takes a little bit more to, to get them to come out of their shell when they, when they need a real strong uh, exuberant reward for the dog. Um, it makes a difference. Makes a difference. Absolutely. Uh, another question for you from Kenneth Schaefer. Uh, how do you feel about moving a canine to a new handler if the, ha if the original handler was promoted out when the dog is still young enough and only had a few years on the road? Not an issue at all. That dog will convert over without any problem at all. Um, and I know that this becomes a, a difficult thing, particularly for the handler that's giving up the dog, uh, because you become bonded to the dog. Uh, for lack of a better term, you end up loving your dog. You begin to get into that, that bonding and that love relationship with your dog. Um, you don't want to give it up. It becomes a part of the family. We just we spend more time with those dogs. I know that a lot of times you spend more time with the dogs than you do with your own family sometimes. It's, it's not fair, but that's just the way life is when when you start working this job and that's got to be understood. And uh, there's just days that are like that. So yeah, it's, but it's never, it's never really an issue. I've seen dogs that have transferred uh, handlers in very short order. Where I have a problem with it is when the dog is older. When the dog is older, it's not, a lot of times they'll remove a handler, maybe to punish that handler for whatever reason, and, uh, or maybe he's getting promoted, but they'll remove the dog from that handler and they'll try to give it to somebody new, even though dogs maybe only got a year left. And that's unfair to the department as much as it is to the, the handler. You know, the dog will adjust either way, but what happens is the department now is gonna have that dog for a year and then gonna have to retrain again and get another dog. Is it really worth that year with that dog to do that and end up having to send him away for two different courses? Whereas they could end up having a full eight, nine years out of a new dog if they just bit the bullet and did it all at once. So it depends. They've got to sort of, you know, look at the the benefits as opposed to, you know, what the negative might be and, and balance that out. Excellent. And and kind of to that point, I, I know there's some studies out there, and forgive me, I can't recall the name of them that talk about the uh, reduction of effectiveness in the dog after re 
uh, I think three handlers or maybe it was four handlers. Can you expand a little bit on your experience uh, with dogs that have had to go to two, three, four handlers or more? Yeah, I can, because I, I won't name the agency, but I, early in my career, I was very close to a very large agency that, that did that. They actually rotated their dogs every second year. Oh, wow. And, and that was the, the thought process at the time by the supervisors of that particular agency, or the management team rather, was that it was to give as many people in that agency an opportunity to become a dog handler as possible. So it was done as a you know, sort of a routine to support the troops. But in reality, the dogs, it takes about two years before a dog starts to really become productive with a handler because they're getting to know each other still. They're starting to bond, they go through the training, they're starting to do really, really well together. But there comes a point in time where the handler's learning and then and the dog's learning and they're learning about each other. But there comes a point in time where all of a sudden the handler realizes that he's not having to work so hard at it. He understands his dog and his dog is starting to relate to him and is starting to do things without being asked or told or, or directed in any way, shape or form because they have an understanding together. And when you've got that, you've got a pretty solid team. And to break that apart and then start that dog over new again, you might have somebody that's got a totally different personality. You might have somebody that's got a totally uh, different way of communicating with that dog that that dog really doesn't understand. The dog will learn it, but again, that dog is going to go through a new process over that period of time again. But so, you're regressing. Yeah, exactly. He's going to go back and he's going to have to learn it all over again. And you might, if you, if the handler has got a totally different personality and they will all have somewhat of a different personality, that dog is going to have a steeper learning curve. It's more on the dog than it is on the new handler. So it's, that's where you have a problem when you keep rotating handlers to new dogs. It's just the wisdom just isn't in doing it. Excellent. Another question uh, from, let's see here, from C. Green. Um, your preference, is it better to train every day for an hour or two uh, rather than training for, you know, four to six hours at one, you know, one day a week? Uh, and also because the dog views the training as play, does that reduce the likelihood to overtrain? Um. <laughs> Okay, that another there's some good questions here. Um, there's nothing wrong with going out and doing daily training. As a matter of fact, when you should be going out there and doing spending, even if it's 15, 20 minutes with your dog to keep your dog up on just any kind of connection that you've got with that dog, whether it be hiding something and having him go find it, or if it's out doing just a quick track with your dog or doing a little bit of obedience, keep them sharp in some profile. And I want to say this, because now I'm talking to experienced people, not people that want to be dog handlers. But when you get a dog, the one thing that I would say, if I could push anything to anybody to understand is that your foundation always has to be strong. You can go out there and do all the fancy stuff in the world and have the fancy Gucci equipment on your dog and everything else, everything else but you may not be able to get your dog to release a ball so you could throw it again. And that's kind of counterproductive. <laughs> and I've seen Absolutely. that so many times. Always work on your foundations. To get back to the question, I'd throw in maybe 15, 20 minutes a day. And then you've got your one training way, uh, training day a week that you do for, like with us, we used to do a six hour training day every Thursday night. And then when I was out on the road, guaranteed I would get a minimum, a minimum of three tracks in a night, as long as it wasn't too busy for me to do that. The tracks don't have to be long, but every once in a while I'll throw a long one in. And the reason why simply is because short tracks and the repetition builds the dog's ability to track, it teaches the dog tracking, it builds that tracking skill it's set in the dog, and the length starts to build the stamina in the dog. So there's two different reasons for, for what you do there. But, you know, I wouldn't spend a lot of time uh, on, on everyday training more than about 15 or 20 minutes, but I, and there's nothing wrong also with taking a couple of day break. You know, throw them up for a couple of days. And when they come out, they're anxious to get out there and do whatever you want because they've been pent up in the kennel or whatever, haven't done anything for a couple of days. So there's nothing wrong. I don't think you can overtrain unless uh, if you're at that level. You can overtrain, however, if you're, you know, going out there and insisting that you're doing steady training for an hour or two every single day. Um, even when we go through our 12 and 14 week training schools, we're doing eight hours a day we will make it a variety that we do and it changes up all the time we're never doing the same thing 
you know, for any great length of time without throwing something else into the pot to make it a little bit different. And we have a little bit of downtime in between the exercises. So it's, it's one of those things that um, you don't have to push it every single day to keep the dog's skills up, but you should do something with it. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Scott Anthony. Uh, and he is asking, how do you feel about search and rescue and law enforcement tracking teams or training together? Or I'm just going to add this deploying together as well. Uh, sometimes there's a bloodhound with search and rescue, and then you've got your dual purpose dog in the back, but also just training together. What are your thoughts on those? I, I think both, they, I think they can learn from each other. Um, I, you know, the, the only problem is, and I'll be, I'll be honest, you know, the blue line is it can be a little closed. And sometimes it's tough to, to get through. But if you can build a relationship with that um, and you can go and you can track with each other and, and you can challenge each other on your tracks. And, and that's the whole idea is when you go out and track, don't do the same thing all the time. If you're going to go out and train with each other, find little, little ways to what they're doing, observe what they're doing and challenge them a little bit more to make them a little bit better. And then when they get really skilled at that, then challenge, challenge them again. I strongly feel that no matter who it is, we can learn from each other. There's always ways that you can learn from each other. Um, and I would encourage it. I don't see any problem with that. And as far as deployments is concerned, that's a different kettle of fish. Absolutely. I have no, okay, I have no problem, uh, you know, that if in a pinch you need to go out and, and do a search but uh, for law enforcement, but you want to really reconsider uh, that option if you're looking after somebody that is potentially armed or is a violent suspect because it's like any anything else even though you're there and you found the, the the suspect in the end and you've done the job that you should be doing and you've been asked to do in the end you become a potential liability simply because now those officers that are with you have to take into account your safety and what's gonna happen and how to get you out of that situation so they can then deal with what the end of the situation is because a SAR dog is not gonna take down a suspect. But as far as other types of things, looking for lost children, um, you know, things that don't involve uh, violence, then I would say it's, you know, again, it's, it's dependent upon your individual law enforcement agency and how well you have a relationship with them, but I would have no problem with, with certain things with certain limitations. Very fair. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? And forgive me if I skipped one. Um, but if anyone has any other questions, now's the time to add them in there. But I think we've covered just about everything. Um, oh, here, here's a new one from Dan Mitri. What are some ideas, tips on integration of a new police canine at home? with uh, family, dog, or pets, or babies? Like, how would you recommend that integration for a new handler? Well, again, you know what? That's one of those things where it depends on what the family situation is, right? Uh, if I would start off really by um, gently introducing the dog into the family situation with babies. You never want to leave them alone with a baby. Um, the dog itself can be left outside in a kennel, and I know a lot of people don't like that, uh, but they're not, they're not a family dog. They acclimate better. They perform better if they're the left outside in a kennel and they're used to the weather that's outside. Uh, they acclimate, acclimate better and they perform better when they're on the road. Um, as far as introductions are concerned, uh, if you've got another large dog at home, one of the ways that you could do it is by muzzling both dogs when you do first introductions and just make sure that things are going to go okay there in that, in that kind of respect before you just sort of turn things loose. Um, slow and easy, really. You've got to judge it uh, as it comes. You've just, as you introduce them in, you've got to see how they react. There are times when you may have to make a decision where you don't allow the two to mix, where you do may basically restrict that dog to a kennel. And that, that should be a, a priority in most cases anyway, depending on what your individual department thinks. I know some don't like that uh, because they bond to the dog. They want the dog in the house all the time, that kind of routine. I was that way. I even used to write my first book. I think I wrote like that. Uh, but as time went on, I found I was a better, better performing dog when he's out in the kennel more. Excellent. And I know uh, you had mentioned that you didn't want to turn this into a sales pitch. And I, I greatly appreciate that. But we do have a specific question from 
Ryan Dumond of what the name of the book is that we keep talking about and where can we get it. So cool. here's my copy, at least. Um, it's probably not coming through too much, but uh, Canine Supervisor's Manual, Dynamics in Developing and Managing Police Canines uh, by R.S. Eden, also known as Bob Eden, but it's available on Amazon. It's available at a lot of different places, but do you have more to add? Uh, no, uh, Amazon is probably the quickest and dirtiest you can get it. I know it's got, somebody out there has even got it in color, I think, in a, in a uh, it's not Kindle, but I think Google Books might have it on, uh, in a color version electronically. Um, but Amazon is probably your quickest and dirtiest, and the print copy is probably the wisest way to go because you can then hand it off. The, 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 the reason why I wrote this book is that I was getting frustrated. Um, it's my third book, and I was getting frustrated with what I'm seeing across North America with a lot of management teams, particularly in the States. There are so many handlers out there that are just solid guys and gals that work hard. Uh, they do the job. Um, and they're out on street corners selling t-shirts trying to, to pay their way. And I, I just don't, I just don't get that. There's so much need for charitable organizations and really uh, it's because that they're not properly budgeted for. So the reason for the book was to do it in support of handlers to help managers understand what's needed by the handlers and how they can make their handlers better and how they can reduce liability by budgeting properly and give them, giving them the equipment they need. Um, it goes through everything from dog selection, vendor selection, uh, the whole gamut of it. Uh, but that's, <laughs> that's my whole uh, purpose behind writing it is that I wanted those on the street to be supported, um, especially for those agencies that have supervisors that don't have experience. Um, there are some agencies, we do a canine supervisors course in Lake Tahoe every spring, and we do one down in Texas every second year. And every time we do the one in, in California, it's almost like every time we do one, I would say uh, a good 60% of those handlers are in that class, or not handlers, but supervisors have got no canine background at all. And they're also been told to take that position. And they've also been given other assignments that they're responsible for, not just, not just the dog unit. So that makes it a real struggle for them. And in fairness to them, they try real hard and we try to give them as much information as we can in the classroom. But that's the type of people that I wrote this book for in support of the handlers. And so hopefully when, when you get it, the idea of having the print copy is share it with your management teams, get it around to as many people as you can to help yourself out. And, and that's hopefully will help them do you better in the long run. Excellent. Uh, I think we're pretty much ready to wrap up. Uh, so if you want to add any of your final thoughts, and then we also have one last question from Nathan Houston, essentially just any last tips for someone who's going into that canine handler position interview. Um, you know what? Be positive. Go in there confident at knowing that you're going in there for a very challenging position and with the attitude that you're willing to meet that challenge. Do whatever you can to be physically capable of putting going through anything that they might put you through. And don't go in there nervous about what you're doing. Go in there with the expectation that you're gonna you're gonna make it and you're gonna do a good job at it. Go in there very, very positive because that's what they're looking for. Somebody that's positive, somebody that's creative, somebody that's willing to be uh, flexible and roll with the punches. You'll do okay. Excellent. Uh, I think the threat of letting you go just brought in a couple, two more questions, and then we'll uh, we'll let you get back to your day. Um, one specific to tracking or trailing. Um, do you believe that the handler should be laying their own tracks? so they can read their dog knowing exactly where the track was laid? Or is it better to have someone else lay those tracks for the benefit of the dog team? Both. So I would say, and I'll, I'll put it this way, virtually 80% of the tracks that I did throughout my career were self-laid tracks. I would go and lay a track, I would leave it for five, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, right up to six, seven hours. And I would make them challenging for myself. I would challenge the dog on something new that I wanted to do. Uh, and the reason why we do that is because I want to be able to, to uh, condition my dog so that when I do certain things with my line, 
that the dog will correct itself. And the only way that I know that my dog is starting to go offline is if I know exactly where my footprints have gone. So in those particular cases, I'm building up the dog and working with the dog in a way that teaches him how to basically stay true to the track. And I'm also conditioning that dog so that when I go off and I start doing regular patrol work and I'm casting my dog out, if I want to line check my dog and find out if he's still on track, if I line check him and I see him start to move over, I know that, yeah, I've caught him. He went off track a little bit. I'm doing my line checks frequently enough that he's telling me that he's been off track and he's coming back to it. If I line check him and he comes off and he starts to circle around, I know that I've just missed a corner somewhere and I need to re redeploy the dog. I do that by those tracks that I lay myself because I've seen how the dog performs in every possible imaginable way uh, when I lay those tracks out and I know where the dog goes or I know where I went and where the dog follows. Um, then I also have them laid by other people. Totally unknown tracks are unknown to me. Um, and you can do single, you know, single laid tracks, double laid tracks, whatever, when you're doing the initial training. But then when you start laying tracks out and you're getting into more realistic stuff, you want people that are running and jumping over things and so on and so forth. But somebody goes with them that knows exactly where that track goes. And that's another failure that you see with trainers. They'll take a map and say, I want you to go here, 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 and here. Uh, as a trainer, I will go out and drive and show my decoy exactly where I want him to go for the person that I'm training. And then I will get out of my car and I will run with the handler when he does that track because I've actually watched and shown the decoy exactly where I want him to go so I know where it's at. So I can't get into a situation where I'm, I'm allowing the dog to fail or I'm messing the dog up. So both come into play. Excellent. Uh, the last question, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit of just uh, thoughts on agencies bringing in supervisors uh, that don't have any experience in canine handling. It's going to happen. I mean, it, it, it's very, very common. And I feel bad for the handlers because it's like every time they get somebody like that, they've got to retrain a new supervisor. And it's hard on the supervisor because they're usually there in a position that they feel very insecure with to start off with and they need you they need you to help them uh and to teach them what you need to in order to support you and so it puts them in a very untenable situation at times um so the best that i can can suggest in that case is sit down with them invite them out to training we try to encourage supervisors to get out to training as much as possible to show that they just if nothing else that they care about what you do but it also teaches them what you're all about and how you train and why you need all this time so um, make a connection when they get there support them as much as you possibly can and Really, it's it's going to be that relationship building that you do between yourself and that new canine supervisor is going to help them grow. And that's where it falls into your lap a little bit more. Excellent. Well, any closing thoughts, uh, any pearls of wisdom uh, to close this out that you can share or would like to share with us? No, I'm, I'm very honored that I was asked uh, to do this, Ryan. It's, um, and what was really nice is that you selected a, a chapter out of the book so we could focus on one particular thing and get down to it. I'm surprised at the number of people that checked in with us and I'm honored. I, I'm humbled by that. Um, I promise you the honor is mine. <laughs> so I just, I, I want everybody to go out there. I want them to be safe. Uh, if there's ever anything I can do to assist somebody, uh, I'm only an email away or a phone Excellent. call. Thank you so much, Bob. Truly, this has been eye-opening for a lot of folks, uh, including Folks that have been in the in the business for a long time and people that are really trying hard to break in to the business as well. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to close this out here, please. If there's anything that ICRWDA can do uh, for you guys as handlers, of course, I'm retired law enforcement. So cops are always part of our scholarships as well as all of these webinars and whatnot. Our focus is a little bit more towards the, the resort and casino and tourism side but my heart is always blue um and i am very much appreciative of all of you that came in today um this will be or has been recorded i will get this up on youtube uh probably in about a week or so with a few edits i'll also add a link uh to bob's book as well as some of the scholarships that we're offering and bob uh, will also put your email if that's okay with you yeah absolutely um, at the end as well as ours um 
we're absolutely honored to have you. So thank you again and uh, be safe up there in, uh, in Canada. No problem there. Thanks, guys. Everybody be safe. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Mm hmm.